Welcome to the Business of Government Hour TV, a video companion to our flagship radio program. I'm Michael Keegan, your host. Each week, government executives and thought leaders join me for an informative, insightful, and in-depth conversation on improving government and its effectiveness. These individuals are truly changing the way government does business. What are the U.S. federal government's IT modernization priorities? And how can the federal IT community leverage technology to provide good government? I'll explore these questions and so much more with our very special guest, Suzette Kent, the Federal Chief Information Officer within the Office of Management and Budget. Also joining my conversation from IBM is Lisa Muscolo. Take a look and take a listen. Download the entire interview at Podcast One iTunes and at businessofgovernment.org. So, you know, uh, transitioning to your specific roles, what's the duty of the federal CIO, Chief Information Officer? And perhaps you could tell us about your portfolio. Okay. The official duty of, Mm -hmm. of the federal CIO is actually development of policy for use of technology across all the federal civilian agencies and oversight on what outcomes are actually achieved in accordance with those policies. Um, But I like to to really think about myself and my team as the enabler of the federal agency. So what we should be doing is building policy that helps agencies use the best of what is available from a technology capability standpoint, um, mature business processes, leverage industry best practices, and ensure that there aren't barriers in the end-to-end process, which that's where I partner with my um, other M-side team members from procurement and people enablement uh, to ensure that we can deliver on the technology agenda for the federal agency. So those currency um, modernization, currency of technology, modernization, and enablement of the workforce are the high priorities on my agenda. Great. What are some of the top challenges you're facing in your current role? I, I, I did kind of touch on one of them. Um, pace Mm -hmm. and the ability, particularly in the cyberspace and technology modernization, and then our people challenges, we have to move very, very quickly. And we're operating in an environment that is not operationally set up to do that. Um, I was very glad to come into the government at the time when the technology, the um, MGT Act created the working capital funds and the technology modernization fund so that the ability for an agency to have multi-year money for a large-scale transformation and to leverage their own savings for ongoing enhancements, those things felt a lot more like um, private sector enablement. It's also a motivating factor um, for agencies. Operating and working with the Technology Modernization Fund gives us the ability to um, shorten the time between having a great idea mm-hmm. and actually getting that idea out and seeing the early returns. Um, so it's working in exactly the way Congress envisioned. And the, you know, when I say urgency as well, that's one of the the policy areas where I'm most focused. Many of the policies were more than a decade old. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I been very focused on and brought a lot of urgency to is updating all of those policies. And as of um, the 27th, we have four of the major ones out. We have one more um, of the major ones to go. And we will be at a place where all the major components of policy have not only been brought to at least current, we've outlined some protocols for keeping them current. So it's hard to use modern technology when you have a policy that's a decade old. And so shortening the time, if I boiled it down to a single statement, um, focusing on the right priorities, Mm -hmm. so cybersecurity, modernization, workforce enablement, and then laying the foundation with data, those priorities, and then urgency around how we're attacking each one of those, but still using a risk-based framework with the agencies because they can't do everything at one time. You know, there's a question I always ask our guests, and I, it was one I reintroduced to the set, and it's about leadership. Given your private sector experience um, and now your public sector uh, service, oh, in your mind, from your vantage point, what makes an effective leader? What are some of the characteristics? That That's a question that I, I think about, um, and, and I've thought about it in exactly the way that um, you phrased it as 
what what was effective in private yeah. sector <laughs> and what's the same and what is different in um, public sector. Some of the some same things, you know, the, the depth of subject matter skills, um, listening, mm -hmm. the commitment to understanding exactly what the business is about and listening to the constituents that you're serving and the leadership as you're defining the vision. Um, those are very common. Those are the same. And attention to customer service. Um, that's one of the things I will say as both a citizen and in this particular role, I've, we, have a, we have a long way to go um, in the federal government side and coming out of private sector. Deep attention to customer service was so important. So when I think about leadership in the federal government space, um, the communication with that broad group of stakeholders takes a different approach. Mm -hmm. It's much broader and there's more disparate interests than, say, in a corporate world where you're talking to stakeholders, you know, the, uh, shareholders and, you know, and, and you're motivated by a smaller number of things. There's a broader set of motivations, yes. um, as well as clarity of the vision and how to execute on that vision. Um, again, more complex operating environment and what what I have observed and what we've seen with some of the policy updates is that sometimes when people hit a barrier that stops progress. Yeah. And so clarity of, of how defining not only where we're going, but the steps of how you get there and how we overcome the barriers takes a different level of intensity and support. I would like you to delve a little bit deeper into the federal IT strategic vision. What are your key priorities or what are the administration's key priorities around federal IT? So the key priorities are largely laid out in the president's management agenda. And I'm, I'm going to start with that, but I'm going to go a little bit deeper sure. on a, a couple of the ones that are very focused um, around the technology actions that we're taking at agencies. So, you know, the PMA had three main tenets for serving of mission, improving service and customer service, um, and then development of our workforce. And those are, the, those are the, the top elements. But to achieve that, the approach that we're taking is technology modernization, which includes all of our cybersecurity, um, a specific focus on data accountability and transparency and how we use data as a strategic asset um, and, you, and, and become a, a data-driven um, government and then um, our workforce and the investments that we make in the workforce. And it's important that those things all move together. And some of the policy updates and other things that I've talked about, some of the key things that we've done is ensure that um, all the components of the wheel move at the same time. So as I'm moving to a new technology, it's a critical commitment that I am investing in my workforce to build those skills. And as I think about um, different ways that we are using data, that we build the controls and we build the data scientists and the data labelers and those skills right along with it. So if I take those and I, and I pull it down a little bit more in the IT modernization area, it's many of the policy updates that we talked about. Mm -hmm. How are we using cloud? I mean, we've, we've had a cloud first policy for more than a decade. We've moved that to cloud smart so that we can take advantage of enhanced capabilities of markets being able to deliver. It is more, there's, there's more, but it's more complex. Mm -hmm. So the security and the procurement processes had to go along with that. Um, Cybersecurity is an every single day priority, and it's part of the modernization agenda because modern technology is easier to protect. Mm -hmm. And our a lot of our cyber energy is spent protecting systems that were um, that are very very old and very difficult to protect. So as we modernize those, our you know threat surface and our security environment can actually improve. Um, and then on the data side, not only using data and, and from uh, for what we're doing now, but laying a long-term foundation for the way that we use advanced technologies and balancing protection and privacy with transparency and availability of data. And those are some very robust debates. <laughs> and those have been, you know, great discussions as you think about everything from geospatial to healthcare to transportation to operational data. There's different views and, um, you know, different protocols that need to go around those. And then I spend a lot of time on workforce development. And 
workforce underpins all of these other areas. When we think about technology modernization, some of the barriers have been that we didn't have we didn't have the individuals who understood some of the newer technologies. So we weren't moving fast enough, or sometimes we would we would not even um, fully utilize what we bought. We'd buy you know a capability that could do ten things, and we'd use two. Um, because of those are the skills that we had, so we're making investments there in the cybersecurity space. I I know it's you know very well known um, that we have many gaps, and the industry itself cannot fill all of the needs. And you know we're part of that, so we're looking at creative ways, both bringing people in from current areas into cybersecurity, developing our existing workforce, creating uh, broader mobility, creating changes in the reward system. So things that um, bolster um, the the workforce in that area and then building skills in the data spaces. We have many agencies that actually have very limited um, data skills and data capabilities. Mm-hmm. So that's a, a long, yeah. you know, kind of top Top line, mission, service, stewardship, um, and, and being effective uh, at how we um, use taxpayer dollars driven by technology modernization, how we use data, um, investments in the workforce, and then tactically driving each of those down um, to individual. There's some other very specific goals for how we achieve this. So the federal government spends, you know, $80 billion a year on IT. Something like 70% of that is on O&M. Mm-hmm. So you've hit on this a little bit, but, but tell us about your thinking around how, how we can sort of reduce that 70% when we're talking about legacy systems and actually be able to spend more money on the future technology upskill in the workforce. How do you think about um, the antiquated systems and moving forward from them? A um, couple of different things. So a a kind of normal, very healthy private sector practice that we are strongly encouraging and, in fact, supporting with any agency is is doing an application rationalization, sitting down and looking at your entire application suite and identifying what can I automate, what can go to the cloud, how can I get it there, where are my risks, and what maybe, do I not even need anymore? And we've actually found that. Um, some of the agencies where, where we've gone through that disciplined process, you know, they, we may actually find that 30 or 40 percent that's, uh, or 30 percent, you know, that's sitting in the environment, we can actually do differently or bring in, you know, to something else. We're also, that also gives us a very clear, realistic picture of what can we move to cloud and what's the right sequence. And then have a risk-based approach to what moves when. Again, you know, the what many of the agencies have to do is very daunting. Um, and they can't do everything at one time. Yeah. They have to make choices and choices based on um, risk or service or mission. Uh, achievement of the mission is, is kind of how we have to prioritize um, those different things. We're also trying to do things, um, and I mentioned the technology, uh, the CIO Council before. Through the CIO Council, we're looking at common problems and doing pilots and investments so that we learn how to and we learn the way so that we can replicate that much faster across federal agencies and be able to accelerate. We've done that with cloud email. Um, We have done that. We're in the process of doing that with a couple of other things right now. and we're going to continue that we've standardized some jobs, particularly the um, CISO handbook, so that we're all doing it the same way, so that we can actually move um, through the sets of objectives that we have in, in a common manner. And then I mentioned the Technology Modernization Fund um, before. That's another way where the board is enabled to fund certain initiatives that um, have very clear returns. They have, um, they're achieving some area of modernization, um, whether that's data center, whether that's um, moving off of antiquated systems, development of shared services, different types of things like that. But the projects that the board looks at um, that that are exciting and that they have funded have an all of government benefit. So there, there are things that the outcomes and the lessons learned and the path 
that that particular agency goes through with that initiative can be shared and and more broadly leveraged. So we're trying to define a path and have direct support. Um, We're investing in other areas where we know there isn't a path yet, and and we're collectively kind of looking in in the Petri dish, um, trying to see, you know, the best way to do it. And then we're using other creative funding tools and mechanisms to support agencies' individual journeys. So tell us a little bit about some of the key cybersecurity challenges that the feds face today. How are you working to address these challenges and working to mitigate the risk and the impact of threats uh, to the government and the government systems? Um, so cybersecurity is one of the things where I, I talk about the most with individuals, but I spend the most time on. Um, and it's one of the, the, the things when I talk about a privilege to serve our country, it's one of the things that we have to get right um, and needs a lot of attention and elevation. So we talked about technology modernization um, earlier and the fact that it is very difficult for us to protect older systems. And in fact, we've had to, um, in partnership with DHS, we've identified the highest value assets. That's one of the efforts that we've done across every single agency to make sure that we put our most intense focus in those areas. And, and that that's our our priorities, you know, and our focus. And so, so there are strategic sets of efforts. There's some things that I'll I'll actually call um, blocking and tackling, but mm-hmm. consistency in blocking and tackling. So, about um, a fifth of our threats come from email, yeah. right? And, and so, there's a human behavior element, mm-hmm. but there's also a technology modernization element. So that's why we're trying to get people to modern email and to cloud email to also build, you know, protocols, you know, around that and then support that with the human behavior side. Um, But that's somewhat of a blocking and tackling. Some of the other things are, you know, areas where we have known patches and we have known threats in the industry. So when we talk about threat sharing and activity going on, ensuring that we're prioritizing those things um, across every one of the agencies uh, through the the FISMA guidance uh, that we have now, you know, been, been putting out in multiple years continue to raise the bar on how we know who's on, um, who's accessing our systems, you know, what we're doing, that we're reporting information into a central point, that we're ensuring that um, we're enabling uh, DHS's mission through uh, ensuring that everyone is sharing information and we can look as an enterprise. um, And address our risks. And at the agency level, um, I've already talked about workforce, but we have very specific activities around driving the consistency of what we expect our cyber professionals to do, to building and keeping our, you know, cyber professionals across all the federal agencies, and in some cases, um, increasing mobility so that we can move people between agencies sometimes that have different sets of experiences um, so that we're taking that same risk-based mindset and um, how we address the the various needs of the team. Um, It it is also one of the areas where you saw in the National Cyber Strategy that we're making some commitments to leveraging more advanced technologies, both from um, an approach in how we protect ourselves and we make ourselves more secure and we reduce our threat surface, but also in enabling our workforce for how we defend. Mm -hmm. We know and we expect that a large volume of um, some of the the threat, external threats, are actually going to be coming from those same advanced technologies. So we have to know it to use it. We have to know it to fight it. I'd like to transition a little bit to the data strategy, the federal data strategy. It's gotten to the point where it's even a a cross-agency priority goal. Um, I believe the title is Leveraging Data as a Strategic Asset. Mm -hmm. From your perspective, what can you tell us about the strategy? What are some of the core elements? And, you know, related to the CAP goal, how are you using incubator projects? All right. That's a bunch of questions. (laughs) That's a bunch of questions. So I'm going to start at the top with it was very important that we separated data as a as a cross-cutting cap goal from the technology agenda so that we could bring the right discipline and focus to using data as a strategic asset. And so so that was 
a, a really important um, kind of uh, point of of importance and definition of importance. And what we realized is that the way agencies think about data varies significantly. Mm-hmm. And even across the federal government, there are some that think of it as statistical. There's others that think, you know, that are looking for research. There are others outside. They're actually looking at data to power our economy. Mm-hmm. So there were many ways that people wanted to use data. But also as the federal government, it's incumbent upon us to protect the privacy and the security of that data, um, it's coming from citizens. And um, so we have certain sets of requirements that, you know, regardless of what the intended use and outcome are, we have obligations to uphold. So the data strategy was an intent to build a decade-long strategy, but informed with very tactical, near, not only near-term definitions and steps, but incubators and proof points so we can say, did we get it right? And so the first thing was to develop some kind of what I'll call North Star, some principles. And that tried to bring together why we the, all those different purposes. So why do we care? And what's important about how we think about data? And, and those are the North Star principles. Right now, out for review are what we call practices. So what are healthy activities that an agency and, and, and ways that an agency should think about how they use data, protect data, make data available, and think about data in their organization. And that spans everywhere from the operational use, the mission-serving use, and the statistical use, the external use. So, so the whole range of, I have data and what am mm-hmm. I doing with it? Um, and we're, as we're going through those principles and practices, we, we have deeply engaged academia and the private sector. Unlike many of our other CAP goals, we've hold, held multiple events um, both at the um, White House and with industry to get feedback. Um, we've had, you know, bipartisan engagement from Congress. Uh, we, we have looked, you know, at, we had conversations with other countries, in fact, and what their um, data journey has looked like to build a very informed approach we actually use a team of over 50 individuals that come across, come from all of the agencies to actually lead our work groups and run all the various work groups across the, the, the data initiative that are looking at things like privacy and security, um, taxonomy, yeah. um, sharing principles, commercialization, all those types of things. So the we've got guiding principles. We've got practices that are out. We have a, a, a big collaborative group doing the real work, but we have to prove it, yeah. right? And, and this decade-long strategy is a great thing, but we need to get some real proof points. And that's what the incubators are about, as well as some of um, the proof point cases. And the intent is that the data incubators are going to actually give some small funding for a bunch of ideas that serve mission and try to solve some of the most complex problems that we're working with across the government. It may be something like um, informed, you know, policymaking decisions, you know, examples of the opioid crisis, how do we better enable first responders um, in areas where we collaborate with state and local government? How do we make how do we make that, you know, an easier lift for state and local governments? There are many, many, mm-hmm. many examples, as you might imagine. But the incubators, we're going to pick a few of those. There's a board that's doing review. There's, there's going to be an open call for submission. And we're going to give them some funding to actually create a prototype. And then after that session, we're going to look at the outcomes from that and actually look at some that we're going to give some more money mm-hmm. to scale. Um, to something bigger. And what we intend to do is prove the principles, the practices, and all those protocols that I talked about around use, privacy, you know, et cetera, and use those proof points to inform and continue to update. Mm -hmm. I I sometimes am fond of saying my crystal ball rolled under the couch. (laughs) If you had the crystal ball, what would you see as kind of the important challenges, issues in this space over the next couple of years for the federal government? 
Um, I, I've said multiple times and will not continue is pace. Um, it, it is a continuous challenge every single day to be effective in a cybersecurity space and to continue modernization. It, it is a never done you know, kind of attitude. And on the government side, we've kind of been in a project attitude of we, we get something done and then it's done and we don't touch it again and, and it lives out there. Um, that's not the type of environment that we're in. Um, the other piece is I uh, in the in, in the crystal ball that I hope <laughs> um, it, it's that the agencies are much more focused and motivated by the citizens that they serve, and they're held accountable to the expectations of those citizens. And um, another person asked me, "What does success look like?" And I said, "If I boiled it down to one thing, success looks like a satisfied citizen." Like, well, what, is, what does that mean? What's underneath that? That meant I used the right engagement and the right design principles um, for digital and service delivery for that citizen and developed a, a service or an offering that made sense and met their expectations. It also meant that I was a good steward of taxpayer money because the way it was done in, in, in alignment with you know what they are contributing makes sense. And then I've done it in a way that is secure and modern because I haven't compromised the data. Um, I haven't breached any trust, you know, with that citizen. And so continuing to move quickly, more focus on what we're delivering for citizens. Um, and then, you know, being, you know, kind of personal around the things that we do on the OFCIO side, making sure that the policy stays current and we're leveraging, you know, commercially available solutions, the best of what's in the market. Um, and we continue an engagement model that continues to raise the bar. Before we go, I'd like to get your advice. What advice would you give someone who is thinking about a career in public service? I'd start with do it. We're mm -hmm. recruiting. <laughs> <laughs> um it, it, it is a phenomenal opportunity to serve. Um, I would also say pick an area where you're really passionate. I think the best and the most exciting thing that I see when I go and talk to the agencies is when the individuals are personally tied to the mission that agency is serving, whether it's feeding um, or creating jobs or educating or defending our nation um, or exploring space, when they're personally committed the um, some of the the daily trials and tribulations matter less, and they find a way around them. And those are the people who are also most insightful back to the customer and the citizen that we're serving. They're most insightful about how we deliver on mission and how we actually delight um, that set of citizens because they they care about it. Be sure to join me next time on the Business of Government Hour TV for another informative, insightful an in-depth conversation on improving government and its effectiveness. Until then, it's businessofgovernment.org.